Hey there, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, this is the fourth um, lesson on electrostatics, and um, we're going to build on what we learned in the last video where we talked about uh, potential and potential energy, and we're going to try and find a way to visualize this idea of potential because it's it's new and it's a little bit strange. So a couple things to keep in mind here, just a few bullet points to, to think about. Um, if you have a charge that's moving in an electric field, um, we said that, for example, the direction of an electric field line would be the direction that a proton would want to move in that field. So if you have a proton following some electric field line through a field, then work is being done on that charge. So as it follows the field line, we're doing work on the charge, and if we're doing work, then that means that the potential energy of that charge must be changing. And so as we move charges around, um, we're changing the potential energy. And this relates back to this idea of potential because charges or fields have areas of high, if it's a positive charge, or low potential. And so if you move another charge around in that electric field, then as you go from, for example, take a proton from low to high potential, you're going to be increasing its potential energy. You're doing work on it to move it up to an area of higher potential. And so a reminder, voltage is this energy per unit charge. It tells us how much energy per unit charge we have. Um, and so if we have a surface, if we have, a, if we have a, um, a space, and we're trying to describe how the potential changes, we're going to use this idea of equipotential lines. And equipotential literally just means equal potentials or equal voltages. So when we draw lines on a piece of paper, uh, and it's an equipotential line, it's showing a region of space that has the same potential. Now an analogy that I think is going to be super useful when we think about um, potential as it relates to, for example, gravity, like what's going on there, um, is to think about these potential lines as uh, kind of topographical lines. And our potential is going to give us an idea of height. So if you look at this map here, this is something called a topographical map. If you want to draw a bird's eye view of, of a space and you've got mountains and valleys and things going up and down, if you want to represent those, you might draw these topographical lines. And what that means is you can see here from the side view in this space, I've got kind of a smaller mountain and then a bigger mountain. I can represent the heights of, those, of that surface um with these lines and so these equipotential lines you can see this line here that says 90 you can imagine if i walked all the way around that line that'd be like i was walking around this mountain and i was staying at an elevation of 90 meters so i'm staying the same height above uh, zero um, i'm staying at the same potential and in actual fact if i was to walk around in a circle i wouldn't be doing work because i'm not changing my energy um, if i climb up to 100 well in that case i have done work or if i roll down the hill to 50, I've done work as well. So we can think of electric potential as kind of like being height, where positive charges kind of make mountains and they make really high areas of potential, and negative charges kind of make valleys or areas of really low potential. And you can imagine if you have multiple mountains, well, then they would just make multiple areas of high potential and so on. So we're going to try and visualize this here. We're going to do a little bit of like a, a, a visual experiment where what would it look like if I have a a positive charge uh, sitting in this space. Just one single positive charge. And as a reminder, you could think of this if you like. I'm gonna draw the side view first, whatever that means, a side view of our charge. But it's kind of like a region where we've got a really high mountain, right? So it's like this high mountain peak in the center. And so what will the equipotential lines look like surrounding that? Um, I'm just going to use this really handy, um, this FET simulation that kind of shows this. So if I have a single positive charge, we can see the electric field surrounding it. If I go close to the top of this mountain and draw an equipotential line, we can see that it would be a perfect circle. And as I move further away, then these would be perfect concentric circles. If I get rid of my field, you can see that those equipotential lines, if I stay anywhere on this line, Bring this back here. If I say anywhere on this line, I can see that I'm staying at the exact same voltage. It's like walking around the top of the mountain, but not actually going up or down the mountain. So this picture here, this equipotential line would be just these concentric, if I could draw concentric circles, I would. Imagine if you will, nice looking circles. So then what would it look like if I did the same thing with a negative charge? Well, I guess a negative charge would be the opposite situation where it would be like a really steep valley or something like that. That would be like a really low potential. And so if I jump over to my simulation here again, I move in my negative charge. 
and I add some echo potential lines, we can see that, well, actually, it looks exactly the same. Um, these are low potential, these are negative potentials. Like when I walk around in this space, I can see I'm staying at about negative 20 volts. But um, from the top view, the kind of echo potential lines sort of look the same. And so I might just draw again, somewhat concentric circles while you visualize perfectly concentric circles. So what happens if we combine these together? What happens if we have multiple charges in the same space? And I, I encourage you to kind of think about this and maybe even hit pause in the video and, and kind of sketch out what that picture might look like or, or just sketch it out with pencil and then go back and see if you got it right. Um, because when we have two of these positive charges kind of near each other, they're both kind of like making these areas of high potential, these mountaintops. If I'm close to this one, that looks like a kind of like a perfect circle again. I'm not sure if it is or not, but you can see that if we go a little further away, eventually we get to this space where it goes around both of those. Because if you have two really high mountain peaks, it makes sense that as you get further from that mountain, eventually there will be a line where you can walk around both of the mountains without having to um, climb up or down. When you're really close to this one mountain top, you could only walk around the one mountain. You'd have to climb down in between and back up to get to the other peak. So this picture is gonna kind of, so here's a real test of my artistic ability. It's gonna kind of look like this. And if those were exactly equal charges, then that would be a more exactly equal symmetrical looking picture. But um, as we know about my art skills, they're, they're still in progress. So um, what happens there if I, what happens if this charge here, I'm gonna make like a plus three charge and I put this near like a plus one. What would happen if I, if I kind of supersize my charges? And again, um, go ahead and, and just, you know, think about it for a second. I'm gonna add in these more charges here. So I've got three charges there. Kind of visualize what's going on there. Think about what, um, what this might look like. When I'm close to this mountain, this is very much still kind of concentric circles. When I'm close to that one, it very much looks like circles. But as I get further away, we can see that we get to a point where actually this one here, I'd have to be much further from this mountain in order to be at the same potential as when I go around this one. I can be closer to this mountain and stay at the same potential because it's a, a smaller mountain top, if you will. And so this potential line would kind of go maybe just around here and this one goes kind of just around there. But then this potential line that goes around this one is gonna go all the way around this one. Kind of like this idea here. Okay, uh, we might just do one more just to, just to solidify things. So what happens then if I have a positive and a negative? Um, and I've got so a plus and a minus. And so uh, let's get rid of these extra positive charges here and let's get rid of that positive charge and let's add in here a negative charge. So what's this gonna look like? Well, um, close to this is gonna look like um, the peak of the mountain and close to this is gonna be kind of the bottom of the valley. But as I get further and further away, these circles are not gonna stay concentric and they're not actually circles at all. And if I can get it right, I probably can't get it perfectly right, but I'll try and get as close as I can. If I got it right in the middle, we might notice that there would be a line straight up and down. Now, why is that? Well, think about it. You can't get from the top of the mountain, you can't get anywhere near the valley without crossing these lines, right? This point in the middle here, directly in the middle, would be at zero voltage because the mountaintop is creating positive voltage or positive potential. The valley bottom is creating negative. When those two things add up, they would add up to zero and they would cancel each other out. So this picture here would look kind of like this and this, but then maybe like a bit distorted that way and a bit distorted that way. And maybe I'd have a line right in the kind of the middle keeps it together. So we got one space for one more. Let's just do one more. Why not, right? Uh, let's make this one here um, three plus and this one here one minus. And what's that gonna look like? So I'm gonna add in my extra positive charges to this space here. So I've got a pile of positives. So I can see that here I've got my kind of mountain top and there I've got the valley bottom. But as I get further away, something kind of funky is gonna happen here. Let's see if I can decipher what's going on. We can see that essentially what happens is this 
positive charge is so strong that the point where we'd be at zero voltage, first of all, that's much closer to the negative charge, but it even extends off into space. So zero voltage would happen way over here and around here. So you can see that this positive charge is almost like it's taking over the, uh, the space in that sense. So I've kind of got, um, kind of got concentric circles there and there, but then this kind of goes like this. And then it kind of goes like this and takes over everything and then kind of running out of space. So something like that. Okay, so when we talk about potentials, just like we had with uh, energy, we can have changes in energy, we can have differences in energy, and we can have differences in potential. It's often useful for us to know not just what's the potential at one point, but what is the difference in potential between two points? So if this, this point is this high in potential and this point is this high, I know I'm gonna to have to do work to get that proton up to there. Or I know, for example, that an electron would wanna just go there without any work at all. And so <clears throat> the difference between two points, the change in potential between two points would just be in this case, VB minus VA. So if I have two points, A and B, the potential difference is VB minus VA. It's like the, the point you end up at minus the point you started from. So imagine that I'm uh, wondering what is the potential difference between points A and B? Okay, so I can find, for example, delta V is just going to be VB minus VA. So um, knowing my formula for uh, potential, I could just say this is K times Q over RB minus k times q over ra. And notice that the charge here is the same charge. We're not changing our charge. This 1 8 microcoulomb charge is what is and you can see here that we've got a common factor of kq. So I could write this as kq times 1 minus rb 1 over rb minus 1 over ra. And so subbing in my values I get 9 times 10 to the 9 Multiply that by the charge, eight times 10 to the negative six. And then don't forget to do the inverse, 0 0.5 minus one over 1.0. And so um, the potential difference between these two points ends up being 72,000 volts is the potential difference between these. Now, when we talk about a potential difference, we haven't done any work yet. We haven't moved anything from A to B. So there's no energy involved. We're just saying basically point B is 72,000 volts higher than point A. That's all the information we have. But where that's useful is if we now come along and say, okay, how much work would you have to do to move a proton from A to B? If we actually wanna move something through this space, how much energy is this gonna take? Well, work in this case being my change in potential energy, um, potential energy, uh, potential being defined as potential energy per unit charge, that means my change in potential energy will just be my change in voltage times the charge. So my 72,000 volts multiplied by my positive charge of positive 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 uh, uh, coulombs is going to come out to be 1.15 times 10 to the negative 14 joules. Now, um, I want to point out, it, maybe not a great example, but this is plus 72,000 and this is plus uh, 1.6 times 10 to the negative which means that my work came out as positive as well. And that's because I would have to do work on this proton to move it over here. It doesn't want to go there. I'd have to add energy to the system to move it along. So if, for example, I had done the same calculation with an electron, I would have used a negative charge and then the work would have come out as a negative value because the uh, electron is very happy to move there for me. It's happy to release that energy as it goes. Okay, so we'll look at one last example here with uh, changes in energy and bring it all together. So imagine I've got a, I've got a, a, a four nano coulomb charge sitting here at point A and I'm gonna compress it in to point B. So I'm gonna do a bunch of work on this system to compress it over to point B. How much work must be done on that charge to move to that point? Well, we know that um, our change in potential energy is just gonna be EP final minus EP initial. Now this is gonna equal KQ1, Q2 over R final minus KQ1, Q2 over R initial. But that's a bit clunky and we can see here that we can collect some like terms and write this as K times Q1 times Q2 multiplied by one over R final minus one over R initial. 
way better, so much better as you can see. And so um, uh, now I can substitute in my values. But just think about this before you start plugging numbers in. I am expecting that if I take a positive charge and move it closer to a second positive charge, I'm expecting my, my change in potential energy should be positive. Uh, if I came up with a negative answer, maybe I've mixed up some numbers somewhere. So just be aware of that. So nine times 10 to the nine, and then my first charge is four nanocoulombs, and the second charge is uh, six times 10 to the negative eight coulombs. And I'm gonna multiply that by one over, remember my final is 0.5, so one over 0 0.5 minus one over 3.0. And uh, my total change in potential energy or work would be 3.6 times 10 to the negative six joules. And I got a positive number there, so that makes sense. I'm a little confident in that, uh, in that solution. So then, now imagine what we're gonna do is here, we, we did all this work, so we did a bunch of work to kind of compress this over here. We put it in that space. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna release that charge. So we now release that charge from this point. And then of course, uh, once we release that charge, it's gonna be very happy to go flying back in the opposite direction because it has all that stored energy. So it says, what will the velocity be when it gets back to point A? Well, the energy that um, it gained when you did work going forward. So this would be like a change in potential energy that was a positive. When it flies backwards, my change in potential energy will be the exact same amount, but negative. So the exact same, uh, what was it, 3.6, negative 3.6 times 10 to the uh, negative six joules is what's gonna be released as it flies back to that point. And you'll remember that our law of conservation of energy says that a negative uh, change in kinetic energy is going to be equal to a negative change in potential energy. And so basically all that kinetic energy that we just lost is going to turn into kinetic energy. So negative times negative 3.6 times 10 to the negative 6 joules basically means I'm going to gain 3.6 times 10 to the negative 6 joules of kinetic energy. It's a little bit convoluted, but if you keep track of your positive negative signs, you'll be okay. So if I'm gaining that much kinetic energy, then I know that my change in kinetic energy would just be EK final minus EK initial, where that initial kinetic energy is also zero. And so really, it's just equal to my final kinetic energy. So the final kinetic energy is one half MV squared. And so solving for V, V is going to equal two EK over M, and I'll take the square root of that whole thing. So two times my 3.6 times 10 to the negative six joules. And I have to divide this by the mass of, um, of the charge, which I was told initially is 2.4 times 10 to the negative 21. So 2.4 times 10 to the negative 21. And when you crunch the numbers on this whole thing, I get right around 5.5 times 10 to the seven meters per second. Okay, now that's incredibly fast uh, and um, we'll be getting to the point where we start to see like relativistic effects potentially because that is starting to approach the speed of light. The one piece of good news is that it's not over the speed of light. I know that if I got more than 300 million meters per second, then um, something definitely would have been off. Okay, that is it for potential and potential energy.